Well, the haters gonna hate, 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 and the fakers gonna fake, 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 baby. I'm just gonna make, 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 making luck, making luck. A demanding podcast. Here we are doing an episode. And yeah. Whatever this and is. This is about remake, and uh, we're gonna talk about teaching Dominion as well. Oh, did we start the podcast? Oh, did we? Welcome to Making Luck, a, a Dominion, Dominion podcast. Yeah, d- podcast card games. My name's Adam. Uh, I'm Jake. We're um, doing a podcast. We are. We've been doing this for a year and a half now. Yeah. Without fail. Yep. And, uh... Where I get, we might keep on doing it. There's a small chance that the podcast will continue. At least yeah. for a little bit. Well, yeah. I mean, whatever uh, happens, we'll figure it out, but... Um, I think so, yeah. Yeah. But, uh, I mean... Adam's gotta go <laughs> for a little while. Um, you know. And... Uh... I'm gonna edit that out. Oh yeah, is this still a secret? Yeah. Oh. <laughs> um. I'll just censor that. It's funnier. Well. <laughs> uh, in any case. I mean, uh, it's, it can be not specific, like, cause like I can just say Adam has to <laughs> for a little while. It doesn't imply anything about what's going on. So you two just... episodes from now is gonna be a mini sode. Yeah. I I have to go <laughs> for a little bit. Yeah. And uh, on the mm-hmm. podcast, we're going to do a Q&A episode. Wink, wink. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and so uh, we've already got some great questions. Uh, we're going to be recording uh, that uh, part of the episode has been recorded already. Uh, you know, it's all going to be pre-recorded. I'm going to do my recordings. Maybe Jake lost all the stuff he did before. And yeah. <laughs> so we might have to redo so, yeah. that. Yeah. Uh, if you have any more questions, uh, you know, maybe in a day or two, uh, please get them in. Uh, maybe we'll answer them on this episode or on a future Q&A episode. Um, the, the real reason for the mini-sode will be revealed at the time of the mini-sode. Uh, it's going to be published a little bit early, but uh, don't worry. We're going to have Making Luck, a Dominion podcast for you. Definitely. And uh, maybe some other stuff. So yeah, uh, yeah. Well, we'd like to hear from you about that. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, remake. Yeah, so this is a... Dominion. Yeah, again, this is about remake and teaching Dominion. Um, so we're gonna jump into that. But uh, last episode, we talked about charm and we talked about scepter. Yeah. Uh, so we also played a kingdom that had those two cards in it, and we're gonna talk about that kingdom because we played it out a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so I'll go ahead and read the cards in it. Nice. Uh, so first off, we had fortress, ironworks, priest, throne room. Traitor, Kach, Charm, Mountebank, Scepter, Scholar. We had the event Salt the Earth in the Project Sewers. Uh, once more, for our audio only listeners, we had Fortress, Ironworks, Priest, Throne Room, Traitor, Cash, Charm, Mountebank, Scepter, Scholar, we had the event Salt the Earth and the Project Sewers. Yeah. Yeah, so... We had some disagreement last time on this one. We did. We were advocating, like, completely different decks. And, um... Yeah. I, th- I think it wasn't clear immediately that we were really advocating for completely different decks. It became clear. Uh, because yeah. we opened the same, right? We, we yeah. talked about getting the same open. For sure. Which is, uh, Sewers Priest. Yeah. So I uh, I looked at this kingdom and I thought I want scepters and I don't want charms and basically you open pre sewers you put a single mount bag in the deck and you just shove scepters scepters in the deck and uh, you know you prioritize sceptering mount bank to give them all the junks and you get some provinces whenever you hit eight basically you get a province and you um, you have salt the earth at your disposal. Uh, it turns out, game ends, yeah. Yeah, it, it turns out that Salty Earth can be good in that deck, even if you don't want to trash a province. But like, if you have four, and you got a sewers, and you got a card you want to trash, you might as well salt. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, uh, thinning the card and getting the VP token is just fine. Yeah. No. I mean, you pay. You're essentially paying four to trash a card from your hand, and that's really. What you're, I mean, the VP tokens, whatever. But really, you want the card. Uh, you're paying for to trash a card. Like, 
it's a crappy version of Bonfire, but like, you know, it's, it's just fine to do it. <laughs> well, it gives you flexibility. I mean, you can yeah. trash a province out of supply the, if that helps you, or yeah, not. Yeah, I mean, the fact that the option's there is is nice. Yeah. And I mean, that's for either deck. Both decks have Abscus uh, tactic. Uh, sure they do. My deck uh, has other things it wants to spend four on. I mean, in the matchup... Uh, it's usually the deck I describe doing yeah. that, but sure. Okay, so so that's Adam's deck. Um, what I was talking about uh, was uh, getting Priest Sewers, again, but I am talking about uh, taking an Ironworks and a bunch of Fortresses and Priests and uh, using Charms for plus buy, drawing a bit with Scholar, and uh, going for, for bigger payload. And I thought about maybe multi-province turns, uh, but maybe not like consistent multi-province turns, more just having the option to go for multi-province turns, which is good for endgame positioning and just really reliably provincing with my payload. Um, I also uh, talked about ignoring Mountebank in that context because I thought the, the junking between sewers and priests was so strong. Uh, so you may or may not be able to get away with uh, stay on top of cleaning your deck. Um, depending on how draws go, with uh, ignoring Mountebank and letting your opponent junk you. But the thing is that, like, that deck I'm talking about really doesn't dislike having a Mountebank in the deck, and junking the opponent can test the junk and makes their stuff worse, too. So, like, uh, the deck, I, I, it was a little bit, bit of a miss on my end. You don't skip Mountebank here, even in the deck I'm talking about. Well, it's good to, to have one. To be fair, I do think it depends on what deck you're playing against. Yeah. So, if you are playing against Trader Cash, and they have four traders in their deck, skipping Mountebank seems very reasonable. Sure. Because you don't want to be giving them silvers. And yeah. You'd rather get something else. Uh, There's also, a lot of things you could be doing against that deck and still win, though. <laughs> Okay, sure. I mean, um, Trader Cash is not good. worth playing here, so don't do that. But uh, but also, like, the, the deck I'm advocating for, uh, I mean, it certainly doesn't like the junks. Uh, the deck you're advocating, it doesn't like the junks. But uh, yeah. your deck, I think, dislikes the junks probably a little bit uh, less. Yeah, like that, I mean, that was can, a double negative. Well, it can, it can get rid of them much easier. It, That's what I'm trying to say. It's hurt by having them more, though. Like, it, it dislikes having them more, it just gets rid of them easily. It the depends re- very much on when you get that mount to make and how much you can play it. Exactly, and also, like, when you draw the early junks that you get, because, like, you're junking me a little bit early on, and what hands I draw those curses in initially have a big impact in this non-mirror we're talking about on, like, how quickly I can build this deck I'm talking about. Um, or it, do they deny me? Because f- my, my deck wants to hit four a whole bunch, and so, like, are you... Do Am I drawing these curses in a way that's causing me to hit, like, three and then five and then three? Or am I drawing them in hands that just don't stop me from hitting four a whole bunch? And then, you know... I'm just drawing it with a priest, or maybe you're blocking future curses with yeah. the curses you already have. Uh, yeah, Mountebank is like that. That's what I mean. Dominion is like that, right? Yeah, but I mean, Mountebank. That's why. That's actually why. A little side note. I think Mountebank would be a much more like palatable card. I don't think like people like people know Mountebank is a brutal junking attack. But I think like the reason that it's such a feel bad card in games and makes them so sloppy is because it has that little like escape hatch that people can randomly activate. Um, whereas I think it's, if it didn't have that, if it just junked consistently, um, it would just be like any other junking attack. It's the fact that you can like randomly opt out of it, and then that makes your deck better and able to play more of it. And, yeah. It's funny because like that escape hatch, I think a lot of other people would say that that makes the card feel better I, rather than feel worse. I think they would. I think that they would say that initially, but I don't Let's, think those people have really thought about it. Very it's much. all perception. It's all like it's all what kind of things people care about. And I think like, if they actually thought about the impact, that, it what it does is maybe cause, they wouldn't care, man. We're all special snowflakes. Yeah, that's true. What I'm saying is, what that <laughs> escape hatch does is not necessarily make the card like more or less brutal. It makes it more lopsided. Like, that's what Mountebanks, that's what it does. It makes it more, like, uh, it makes it better for one player and worse for another. It makes you know it what, more stark. Jake, I accept Mountebank for who he is. I, mean, I don't, I don't want to try and change Mountebank, 
I, it's a little late for that. But yeah. <laughs> uh, so anyway, th- this doesn't matter, um, really. Hashtag me too. Hashtag namaste. Okay, so like... So I, how did these decks do against each other? Was one deck better? seemed like 50-50. Like, like it seemed super mm-hmm. draw dependent. Uh, yeah, both decks can win. It, I mean, we played a lot of games. Uh, we couldn't advance, get one to be dominant over like, the other. Sorry in advance, like... Uh, we didn't record any of the games. I wasn't on my home computer when we played most of them, yeah. and uh, so I don't have recordings. I'm sorry. I mean, I I try and record when I can. Uh, this time I couldn't, and I mean, I, we'd already played like ten or fifteen games with this kingdom, and it was just like every. It seemed like every game was decided by who who drew better or who drew worse, and it and like. There wasn't a clear, like, well, you're drawing worse so much more of the time, it must be a worse strategy. Like, there, it wasn't that way. Like, yeah, it, they it, seemed to evenly match. I would even, I could even be convinced that, like, on turn three, turn four, if you have five dollars, you go for the Mountebank Scepter deck, and if you don't, and you hit fours, you get an Ironworks, and you, and you go for this other thing. Like, yeah, this is true. So, uh, that seems to be about the case, and, um, one thing that you had said, one thing I want to clear up about the deck that I was advocating um, that goes for priests and ironworks and fortress and throne rooms and scholars, that, that in charms, that whole thing. You had mentioned that you were going to be putting pressure on by greening and insulting the oath, and you weren't going to let me build that like multi-province deck. You weren't going to let me get to multi-province. And for the most part, that was true. You did not let when me consistently... I, when I won, yeah, that's you, what happened, you right? Did, but, like, when I won, I want to clarify, I wasn't double provincing consistently. I was really single provincing most of the time, but the thing is I could threaten double province, and usually I ended the game with a double province turn. It wasn't so much about, like, building a deck that hits 16 and 2 buys with any regularity. It's just that it can do it at some point. Uh, you have to watch out for that. It, it can empty two provinces from the pile instead of one. And, um, you know, it's hitting it pretty consistently, and it can get, like, province plus something, too. Yeah, that's going to happen when your draw is Scholar, because it's draw to X. Yeah, and, right. Uh, I, I mean, mean, if you have just... a double province turn, you take it. But yeah. yeah. That's just the name of the game. When your draw is draw to X, you're not going to have a full turn every turn. It's yeah. just not going to happen. But, uh, you know, you can have good turns, and that can make up for having worse turns sometimes yeah. if it's good enough. And, and you for know, sure. if you. Uh, that could happen on this board, for sure. Yeah. So, uh. I uh, don't have anything else to say about this kingdom. No. Um, uh, oh, wait, I do. King- That's nope. a lie. I do have something to say. Um, I tried desperately to make Scepter work in that deck you're describing. Oh, in my deck? Yeah. Yeah, and to, like, use Scepter and Scholar together in a deck that did more things. And Scepter does have a lot of cool edge KC support here. It's got Throne Room. Yeah. So you can uh, Scepter a Scholar, and then in your buy phase, if you draw a Throne Room, you can Scepter a Throne uh, throne yeah. Room and then Throne an action that you have in your hand so it's not completely dead. Sure. And you can play your charms, and then you can draw past them rather than trying to draw your whole deck, and then you play your last Scholar and draw your charms to get your buys or your, your gainy bits. Yeah. You can have some really, really good turns, and um, it's really confusing what's happening on those turns, but you can have those turns... And, and those turns are really great. Uh, the problem is, you don't have those turns very often. Well, you're getting junked, too. Uh, oh, if you're getting junked, you don't have them at all. Okay, yeah. Uh, but you, you have to get a lot of scepters. You just have to get so much stuff. And it's the slow. deck isn't consistent. It's slow for not a ton of payoff. Well, it's I mean, slow it's... for a low chance at the payoff. Yeah, it's slow for not a ton of pay- a ton of payoff on like some turns, but the turns are seldom. So like you it, you yeah. need to have more than one of those turns to win the game. Right. And having more than one of those turns in in a given game is just so unlikely. It's not worth playing towards. This is this is a lot of the issue with Scepter Scholar to begin with, and we talked about this last episode. Like it, you can do some really cool stuff with it, but like you need a lot of very specific tools to make that deck consistent. And those tools aren't here. You you need something so that you can start your hand with the actions that you want to be able to scepter and get them in play before you decide to go to your buy phase. Those, right, those yeah. tools just aren't here. 
I mean, yeah, so I will say that between the two decks we were advocating, pretty much the whole kingdom played except for Trader and Cash. Yeah. Everything else, uh, you know, worked into one of the two decks, and most of the cards here worked into both. I mean, Trader and Cash do work themselves into the Trader Cash deck. Yeah. So there we go. So there is that. But that deck isn't good. Right. That's the problem with that deck. Yeah. Rip. That deck. It's bad. Yeah. Okay. Good talk. Yeah. So let's talk about um, remake. Yeah, remake's a card. Yeah. Do you wanna do you wanna do an episode on it? I mean, if we have to. Uh, so it's a <laughs> it's a forecast action uh, from the Cornucopia expansion, and it says do this twice. Trash a card from your hand, then gain a card costing exactly one dollar more than it. So two times and these are like separate instances of it happening so like for whatever that matters like so if you trash a rats you get to draw the card off that rats before and yeah you, it's before not... you even decide what you're gaining but then you could trash the thing you draw off the rat yeah there is a little bit of a rules distinction between this and like something like steward like steward says trash two cards this says do this twice trash you can, a card. you can trash the same fortress twice does it to the remake with, does it work with uh sewers I think it does. I think, like, if you have sewers in Remake, you can, like, trash your whole hand. Like, yeah, but you, trash, if you have trash, steward trash, in Remake, trash. you can trash your whole hand, too. Oh. Yeah. I thought... I okay. thought... Yeah? Leave a comment in the comments. section. Yeah, so this doesn't... I mean, this doesn't matter unless it does, which uh, we're not going to be getting into all the rulesy edge cases with Wandering Winder. Wait a um, second. But maybe he will. Yeah, maybe. Welcome to Edge Case with Wandering Winder, the segment you didn't know you didn't want today we're talking about remake we're talking about remake man not not a remodel remake so something of note about remake is that um, it really sucks when you can't use it to thin things so like um, I don't know when poor house is on the board is the biggest example here like remake goes way down in value because like you can't turn your coppers into nothing, you, you have to turn them into poor houses, which is just terrible. But the edge case to the edge case is when you want the poor houses, which happens like um okay, that's very infrequent. It's very infrequent. It's very infrequent. But you know um so poor house major edge case for remake. You don't want to do it. You don't want to do it. Sometimes though, there's also a cost reduction. So cost reduction you could do some weird stuff with remake um so first of all if you have like one cost reducer in play let's say you've got a duration bridge troll <laughs> now you can like remake your coppers into estates or whatever the least bad two on the board is that's pretty bad actually it's often a lot worse than uh yeah it's often a lot worse than if there was nothing um um sometimes you can um turn sixes into sevens into eights um oh back on the back on the cost reduction plan if you get seven cost reduction effects uh so you have seven highways in play right boom you can remake those coppers into province you can make anything into province except for other provinces or other things that cost eight or more those you can't remake into provinces ever um yeah yeah that's not going to work for you but uh so cost reduction stuff um yeah, what else is going on? Remake, pretty straightforward card, not too much that's edge casey. But there's a couple other things, right? Sometimes there's there's just one card in your hand you want to trash. Like, you've got a hand with some good cards and one garbagey card. You really like to trash that card. Remake doesn't let you do that because you you, you got to trash two things. So um, that kind of sucks. So it can't get rid of the last card very easily. Except sometimes you can play all those other good cards. Eh, eh. And then you only have the remake and the bad card left. And you play the remake, you trash a bad card, and you, you can't trash another card. Cool. Um, sometimes you can discard other cards just to trash that last one. Usually not worth it, but, you know, it might come up. I don't know. Maybe the, maybe the good cards are like provinces. In that case, you, you'd rather discard them than trash them for sure. And, you know, it doesn't hurt you to discard them. So, yeah, maybe that's a good thing. I don't know. 
Um, you know, more often than that, you can just like, I'm going to add another junk card to my deck so that I have two junk cards and now I can get rid of both of them. You don't do that too much because like, you got to carry an extra junk card in your deck, which is the thing you're trying to avoid. So that's pretty bad. So, you know, most often you just, you just kind of live with having one junk card and like, it's fine. You, you kind of have two junk cards because at that point remakes kind of junky. Yeah. You know, anyway. Um... Another thing to note about Remake, the trashing, not an option. Not an option at all. You, you either have to do it or, or you don't play the Remake. Now, why does that matter that it's a forced trash? Well, it usually doesn't because you usually just say, oh, well, then I just won't play the Remake, right? Um, but it can come up. So the most common cases where I, I think it does come up is with Golem, right? golem you uh cascade into uh a remake and you gotta play it you gotta trash stuff <laughs> so there's some anti-synergy potentially um similarly ghost right same kind of deal uh similarly like prince right um maybe you, you shouldn't you know um prince a, a remake very often but maybe because there's such a great combo with fortress maybe you have a bunch of fortresses and you're going to expect that you're going to have a fortress in your hand and so you prince the remake so that you're going to be able to get those fivers every turn because you're hoping you're going to have a fortress but then that one turn shows up and you don't have any fortresses and bad because now i have all these duchies and i'm really hoping to keep them because my whole plan was to go for prince into remake so i could remake my fortresses into duchy duke and now I only have duchies and dukes in my hand, and what am I going to do? Because I can't trash them, because that's like my whole game plan and all the points, so it's terrible. So keep that in mind if you're going for that plan. Uh, also keep in mind that if you're going for that plan, it's a terrible plan, okay? Um, yeah. Um, also, though, the not out, not tra optional trashing thing, it can come up with, uh, if you have like a chain of King's Court or Throne Room kinds of effects, uh, you might have to choose because they're they are may right now that there was an errata on on throne room it's how you may play so like you go throne room throne room on some draw card like say a smithy and then you draw some more cards and now your only action left is a remake and you'd love to be able to trash two cards from your hand but you the only way to play the remake is to throne it and you don't have four bad cards left in your hand so you either have to choose to trash some of your good cards or you now can't trash your two bad cards because the only way you can play remake is to throw it and that is an edge case but that's what you came for for this segment edge case with wandering winder oh is it too early for that or i guess not oh <laughs> all right so anyway um so yeah remake this is like the best Prince target in the game. Second best. <laughs> the Prince of Remake. Yeah, so... There, remake... there is one better. Tactician. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, Remake is funny. I mean, before we get into, like, the the real strategy meat of this, this is one of those cards that you... That makes you really careful to pick up, like, autoplay cards like cards that will play an action from your deck or something that you might have not have control over like if you uh have remakes in your deck maybe you don't want that golem or ghost or feels um, really bad doesn't or it? that squire or whatever Herald. yeah yeah i have squire uh yeah or va vassal sorry. nice yeah vassal yeah i get those two mixed up yeah so um, I have one time played Ghost and it hit my remake. That probably felt amazing. Didn't yeah, it? it was great. Yeah. Um, so that, that was, was a cool. Good turn, yeah. Uh, yeah. So, <laughs> this, okay, this is a really good card. This is a very powerful card. Right. This card Real is good. this card is openable. It costs less than five, so you can open with it pretty much every game. Um, and it says trash on it, and the the number it trashes is more than one. So right away, we're ticking three really powerful boxes. This is an openable card, and per shuffle, it trashes more than one card. Really strong. Yeah, I think the only the only card that costs four or less that trashes faster than this, more cards for each play, is Chapel. Uh, yeah. Chapel's obviously really, really insane. But this is, like, close to Chapel. In, in some cases, this is better. 
I mean, this, like, this, this is the best just... you're gonna get, except for Chapel. This isn't... Well, yeah, I mean, and, like, you know, Chapel thins faster, so, you know, your mileage may vary based on the kingdom, but, like, this isn't just thinning. This is also, like, thinning while... And, and thinning or deck improvement. Thinning and deck improvement. Well, you don't get both at once, usually, but, unless you... Oh, like trash well, estate and like the, the that so, depends on your perspective really like if i remake and i trash an estate and i gain a silver yeah i like to think of it not... as two separate things like i'm gone I, I got the estate out and now i have the silver but i mean sure sure i uh, yeah semantics aside um this is that's like where the cards are really a powerhouse is that it is openable and it does uh, two of the things early on in the game that you really need to do and it does them quite quickly and efficiently yeah just to give you an idea of how powerful this is um back in the jack of all trades episode forever ago before yeah. renaissance was released uh actually even before nocturne was really back in that episode i said there were uh you need a really compelling reason to not open with a jack of all trades and one of them was a five two obviously five twos are different yeah but uh the other one uh, i said was remake yeah, now, I granted, mean, priest didn't exist, and you know, priest yeah. is another one. There's like, like a there's like a class of cards that like can get you to not open with jack, and they're they're notable because of that. Yeah, yeah, like remake, uh, priest, ambassador, steward. Yeah, but like those you Chapel. can open along with a jack. So if I'm looking yeah. at four costs, yeah. like you know, it's remake and priest. Sure. Yeah, uh, and so like that's uh. That's just an idea of how powerful this thing is, and this has a lot of advantages over Jack, mostly because, you know, you can trash coppers with it. So yeah, I don't think we need to spend too much time espousing the virtues of thinning. I think most people at this point understand that that's good and why, but um, we can, like, go into and in, in why opening with a card it, like that is, is quite at good. At least if you're listening to episode 83 of Making Luck, a Dominion podcast. We're going to assume you're cut up to that. And, yeah. and if um, not, we have an episode on trash. Yeah, yeah. So... Um, let's talk about the the particulars and nuances of how you play a remake board. Uh, uh sure. And how you play around having a remake in your deck. So, like, uh, I assume you open with it most of the time. Yeah, yeah. right. And you play it when you draw it. Yeah. We're, we're on is, the hard-hitting comic This is, a this is really good advice so far. Yeah. Uh, let's say I want to trash both coppers in estates, and I could maybe, uh, have a choice. Okay, yeah, so this is interesting. You, you draw this hand, and you... you uh, get to trash. You draw a hand of like a uh, state, a state, copper, copper remake. Nice, and, nice hand. And now you're, you're choosing. And like, let's say there's no two costs you want to buy. Um, so you can trash two coppers, and that thins those coppers. You're gonna uh, have two fewer cards speeding up your shuffle. Or you can trash the two estates, and you're not thinning your deck because now you're putting silvers into it. We're assuming you're not gaining some three cost cantrip. It's the silvers. This is interesting. Like I've drawn this distinction in the past between trashing and thinning. Like usually they coincide, but like with remake, it's really stark. So you trash the estates, and it's producing better hands for you over the course of it. Instead of drawing estates, you're now drawing silvers. Whereas you trash the coppers, and it's speeding up your shuffle. There are fewer stop cards in your deck now. These are two like different effects you're making happen. And so, usually I'm going to say you prefer, in this case, to trash the estates and, and get yourself better hands, because normally, you know, being thin so quickly isn't as important as making your deck able to, like, hit five and six, but, like, it's important to understand uh, the different benefits that you're getting by by playing your remake. Yeah, I, um, I've played, like, multiple thousand games of Dominion, and there's only been one instance where I remember it being good, that, like, oh, yes, it's so important to get thin here that I'm gonna... that, that it's, it's a good idea to trash these coppers first, just so I can get thin that fast. Because you really it's, are giving up a lot to do that. It's super rare. Like, yeah, you, you're giving up a lot. Not only are you now drawing these estates, which are still in your deck, uh, but, like... You're, you're not having the silver, so, like, it needs to be basically, like, you don't care about hitting five or six. Or even four. Right. And so, like, there are a few times when I could see this being the case. Like, maybe uh, for whatever reason it, it's, uh, it, it's so important to be thin because there's some other card in your deck already 
that you need to be playing really quickly. I don't like, you know, the mind, the mind reels. Well, Maybe some traveler or something. I, I'm looking at like I hit five on turn three because I had five coppers. Sure. And now I'm looking at like that that remake hand with two coppers and two estates. And now it's like, well, maybe that fiver helps me deal with the estates and turn them into something better. Or uh, like an upgrade or something. The other situation I could think of it being good is when the cards you want cost two. Right? Like uh, the cards that you want a lot of. Um, like maybe, maybe there's some kind of... silvers are worse than nothing. Yeah, when like silver when is worse than nothing. purple. Yeah. And that doesn't happen very often, because silver is a, quite a good card. Yeah. Um, so in that case, you know, maybe there's some, like, crazy thing where fool's gold is, like, super important. Something like that. Hmm. You know? Leads me to wonder, like, you could be buying a fool's gold by playing the coppers. Whatever. This is getting into the weeds. But... <laughs> uh, so yeah, most of the time you're just going to trash as many estates as you can as quickly as, ca as you can with your remake, even though it's not thinning. I remember back in the day, in the isotropic days, like people would get salty over their <laughs> opponent drawing remake with two estates, and when they couldn't do that. They would I... say like games were decided that way. Okay, games are not usually decided that way, but it's certainly... I understand, like, I mean, it's... I mean, it that's helps. hyperbole, but like, people were saying it. Yeah, that's not really... I mean, like, I... And I would even, like... I'd say, like, drawing Ambassador with Estates, um, that is uh, is more impactful than drawing Remake with Estates, I would say. Well, okay, that's... I would disagree with We're that, We're talking but, about two different things at that point. Uh, right? yeah, yeah, but that comparison means absolutely nothing, and I'll be honest <laughs> yeah. with you, I was disagreeing with him mostly just for the sake of disagreeing with him. I mean, we gotta get a few in every episode why why are we doing this podcast if we can't argue with each other about like things that don't matter yeah uh yeah so like wait to, wait to hear this kingdom this is gonna be great at the end of the episode oh for stay sure. tuned to making luck a dominion podcast but, but yeah anyway um so let's talk about um how many remakes you get yeah. okay yeah so this is another thing we disagreed on <laughs> um so yeah uh you have maybe probably heard me say this if you listen to our uh 55 hot takes episode but uh, Remake is a card that I almost always want two of um, when I want one of. The thing is, like, I mean, there are times when you just don't get a Remake, uh, but, like, usually I'm getting a second Remake, and here's why. So either, uh, and, like, you know, like, I'm opening with one and then getting the other one turn three or turn four. So either they don't collide and I'm thinning twice as quickly, and that's amazing, uh, and then eventually they uh, do collide, and I trash the remake and gain a fiver. Now I have this super thin deck that has a five cost card in it. I'm in great shape. Uh, or they do collide early, and I'm thinning one card slower than I would normally, but again, I've got the fiver, and I have this really powerful thinner in my deck. Uh, the thing is, like, both of these situations are fantastic for you. So you're putting the second remake in your deck, and. Uh, you're setting up a lot of really great things that can happen for you with uh, very little risk because if they the worst case scenario is usually they do collide and you know whatever you you have a fiver to as a consolation prize so like I'm usually starting the with the assumption that I want two remakes and I'm looking for some cool thing I can do some fiver I want in my deck something I can capitalize uh, with that on and if I can't f I'm assuming that uh, off the bat during my kingdom read. If I can't find it, then I adjust my expectations and I only get the one remake. But, like, I think usually you can be pretty safe getting a second one. So, uh, when I read Jake's outline, I thought maybe this is just a difference of perspective. Like, maybe he starts from the different assumption, but we end up at the same place. Uh, I mean, I, I certainly don't start thinking I want two remakes, but... <clears throat> Sure, there are a lot of situations where it happens. Like, if my uh, remake misses that first shuffle, uh, certainly I want a second one there. I'm behind on thinning, and, you know, the second remakes can be valuable. If I have four, and I would rather buy a fiver, and I don't feel like there's anything valuable on four, then sure, second remake is great, because it has all these upsides, and also it'll eventually be a fiver. I mean, I do want to clarify, pretty much most, like, 
most of the reason that I'm advocating the second remake is the same reason I'd advocate a second copy of like most of the trashers you'd be getting. Yeah, early. like Chapel. It, yeah, it's, <laughs> uh, it's because they, you know, it helps you thin a little faster. It's just that remake, um, you know, has this extra upside to it of like eventually you remake the remake into a fiver. Hmm. Hashtag self synergy. Yeah. So anyway, uh, as I was saying, yeah. I hadn't finished making my point. Uh, if there's something else valuable on 4 that I care about, and I'm usually looking at non-terminals, uh, then I'm going to probably end up getting one of those rather than the second remake in a lot of cases. Sure. I mean, this this is going to depend a lot on the kingdom that's in front of you, uh, but usually it's going to be the second remake. Uh I mean, I'm not going to tell you how often either of these things happen, but it's I'm going to tell you the things that I look for. And, uh, you know, you can you can apply that intuition to kingdoms that you see. And maybe you'll get an example of that later in this episode. Stay tuned to Making Luck, a Dominion podcast. So anyway, uh, that's... Uh, yeah, that's that. <laughs> moving on. Yeah, um, so, I mean, Roommate, uh obviously isn't always good. Right, I mean, there are sometimes I mean, it's, it's good for certain things and certainly not good for other things. Yeah, so um, let's talk about the the times when, like, even as a trasher, you kind of like ignore it. Okay, and there are two like really notable examples that are, I think, just like oh, the... I have three notable examples. Okay, well, I only have two. I'm sure there's that this third one is maybe one. Yeah, I just haven't thought about it. Yeah, but um, he hasn't. He probably hasn't thought about it. Yeah, like, if one of these two things is out, I'd say, like, you, you kind of just skip remake. It's kind of a hard counter, right? Kind of? Yeah. Uh, so, uh, the old Pobre Casa? Yeah, Poor House. If Poor House is out, um, That's I gonna mean, be a hard pass on remake. Okay. Yeah, that's gonna be a no from me, dog. Depends on a little bit, because if it's the only way to get rid of your estates at that point, it does still thin the estates, and, like, I, I'm at least considering it. Yeah, that's going to be a no for me, it's dog. It's still usually going to be a no for me, dog. But yeah. yeah um, but yeah, it turns the coppers into poor houses. Unless I want poor house for some reason. Yeah, you don't want seven poor houses, Jake. I hey, promise. you don't know me. <laughs> the, and, well, and let me tell you something that's not going to happen. Only one of us is going to get seven poor houses. Yeah, that's so. not going to... No, you're not going to like <laughs> both go for this and then the poor houses are going to run out and then like now you can really thin your cop. That's not a thing that happens, okay? And then also, well, another thing that doesn't happen... It is a thing that will happen if it happens, I will say, but like... But if you don't do that, you're going to win the game because your opponent is going to... That, that's the reason it doesn't happen. And then, and then also, another other thing that doesn't happen is oh i'm gonna remake my uh coppers into poor houses but then i'm gonna remake the poor houses into estates and then i'm gonna remake the estates into what i want and boom yeah the reason that that doesn't work is that it's bad nice yeah is it, it's just slow like usually i mean you're gonna see this in like every cycle of trashing that takes multiple plays of like lining up the same card with the same junk it's usually just not worth it don't do that yeah like you can like have other examples of this same cycle where like you upgrade know, in turning... poorhouse yeah so is anything like that <laughs> where like any kind of of thinning that involves you drawing the thinner with the junk more than once because you turn it oh, into a different junk hideout yeah like yeah. it's just it's just usually not worth it's doing it's sad well, hideout is actually like the one example where it sometimes is because like you're playing the hideout for but some it, other reason. But it still is time. sad. It's quite sad, yeah. yeah it makes me sad. So, so this kind of turbo turbo remake shenanigans. Okay. Is, uh, I mean, we'll we'll come back to that because you know it's bad for. Anyway, the so, other the other thing that makes remake bad is shelters. Um, yeah, as long as there's like not a good two cost that you want a lot of. I uh, mean, the yeah. thing is that then uh, at that point the remake's still like the coppers uh so like you still sometimes go for it occasionally yeah. but it, it's, it's just a lot certainly worse. a lot worse yeah yeah and like Feel to the bad, point man. that like maybe you skip it and like maybe even you skip thinning if that's your only option or you go for something that maybe is a little happier to trash coppers like i might prefer money lender at that point i might open with the money lender and then yeah. later on get the remake to to deal with the shelters if i still feel like i need to do that yeah 
it also gets rid of the money lender at that point but oh yeah look at that yeah look at that hashtag synergy and then you get the second remake okay so uh <laughs> the um the third one though that you I, hadn't thought of i i don't have this in my outline what is it it's the if you're playing the money density paradigm oh that's not like Okay, yeah, sure. Like, Big Money Remake isn't really any better than regular Big Money. In fact, it's it's kind of worse. It's, like, that, even if you not, put in... That surprises me, because, Even like, if you put in, like, Market Square, like, it's still not even that much better than Big Money. Okay. That surprises me, because um, I would think that turning the estates into silvers would be good enough. Yeah, but, like, you don't hardly ever draw your remake with two estates. So now you're mm. you're trashing one estate into silver, and then you're uh, thinning a copper, copper which okay. is neutral. It's and in not the meantime, enough. you have this remake that makes zero dollars in your deck. You're you're giving up your entire hand to do that. Sure. Okay. Which I is see it. it's it's okay, but like you can really only expect to do that maybe two times, and then your remake's going to be dead a couple times. And you also didn't open with a silver, and like it's really rough. For the record, part of the reason that I'm having trouble imagining this is that playing a money density deck on a board with remake is kind of rare because mm. remake is a card that usually enables stronger strategies. Sure, I but like say, if but... if you're short on a village or, you know, there's no draw yeah. or whatever. I mean, it, it does happen. I played a lot of those back in the day, man. So, uh, the other thing I would say, um, we we talked about remake as a thinner. Mm. We talk about its trashing quite a bit. What about remake? It does say gain a card on it. So what about remake as payload? Yeah, the turbo remake strats. Yeah, where you you can they're remake stuff all the way up in the provinces. Yeah, if there's so. So here's <laughs> what I would say. I would sum up remake as payload in just a few words. Don't. Yeah. That seems. Um, uh, I, my my outline says no. Why would you even do this? Yeah, that's similar, right? Like. Why, what seven costs are you going to turn into a province with remake? <laughs> so just play the seven costs and I have mean, it do that. Like it's even way better. We, we're talking about like gaining provinces with remake. Usually, like gaining anything with remake is something that you can do occasionally in like decks that um, like you've and, and it can even be good. It's just it's really rare that this is good. Like, um, th like, this is really good when you didn't want the card that Remake trashes, and maybe that card doesn't cost zero. So, like, I have a card that I'm done with, maybe another thinner, like yeah. that Money Lender we were talking about. Sure. Or, or that second, second Remake. remake. Yeah. yeah. Oh, um, uh, yes! That was so hot. Uh. Um, the, I mean, the other thing, the other time is, yeah, like, maybe you, you got some card for its on-gain effect, like... I don't know. Spices! Yeah, I was thinking, like, ill-gotten gains, but, Ooh, like, how often is ill-gotten nice. gains good in the first place in that context? Whatever. Um, I mean, usually, uh, remake for the gains is really hard to make work. Like, there has to be something else going on. Like, maybe there's catacombs, and there's some crazy loop you can do. Maybe... Ooh, some fortress? Fortress tricks, is the... Yeah. yeah, fortress is the big one, But right? you still need, like, some... You need a lot of support to get that to work, right? It, and then is, even then, the payload is, what, a lot of duchies? This is taking three cards out of your hand as well. So, like, that's that's something to keep in mind. Like, even when it is possible, it's just not very often good. Because, like, how often is it the best thing there? How often is it worth I building? I mean, around? silver is pretty good, and that only so. takes one card, and it doesn't take an action, and... So, like, using Remake as a, as a sustainable type of payload, I would say that is pretty rare because it's um, it's pretty yeah. high cost. And, like, really, what are you doing? You're adding $2 of value to your deck? It's, it's not feels, good. feels pretty bad. Yeah. yeah. But if you're playing Draw to X, and then... Wait, did we already do the edge case? Okay. That's still not yeah. good, though. All right, yeah. So, um... Yeah. Um, that's most of what I have to say about Remake. That's Remake. remake. This is a pretty, I mean, it's a pretty, like, powerful card. I don't want, the discussion was a little shorter. I don't want to undersell it a little bit. It's just, it's it's kind of a simple card as well. Yeah. So, uh, that's why we have another topic to talk about. Yeah. And this, this is a topic I have a little bit to say about, but mostly this is something that Adam is more the expert on. Uh, yeah, so I have, um, I've been told by some people that I'm good at teaching games. Uh, I would qualify that as I'm very good at teaching a couple of games, and there are a lot of games that I'm not that good at teaching. But, um, I, I don't know if you know the history of my YouTube channel, 
but uh, one of the most watched videos on my channel uh, is a is a power grid tutorial video yeah. where I explain how to play power grid, but also how to teach power grid. And it's a much better way to learn power grid than <laughs> the instruction than book. Pretty much any other way I would go to. I would go to Adam's book video is... to learn power grid. Yeah, That's... the instruction book for that game is not great, by the way. <laughs> so. I mean, there there is a need for a video like that. It tells you things like out of order. It references yeah. mechanics it hasn't explained yet. Anyway, it's not great. But um, but I mean, on top of the fact that it, its competition isn't that fierce, yeah. um, it's I've a good got, video. I've gotten sure. a lot of feedback, and it's funny because every Christmas I get a spike in views. Yeah, people get Power Grid for Christmas, and they're like, "This <laughs> this instruction book is garbage." How do I? How do I learn this? Yeah, and so they they look for a uh, power grid tutorial, and, and my video comes up because it's it's got a lot of views on it. And there's been a lot of good feedback, and um, you know I've explained power grid many many times, so I have a pretty good idea of, of what works. I've seen what resonates with people, yeah. and so um, I'm I'm okay with power grid. Um, I've explained Dominion a lot of times to people, mm -hmm. and there there are one or two other games that I'm pretty good at that I've explained about ten thousand times. Yeah. I really, a lot of people really want me to make a video like that for Spirit Island, but man, I, uh, I don't, I just don't feel like I'm good enough. Like, explaining board games to people is not easy to do extremely well, and no. it's very easy to do very poorly. It so, is, yeah. So a lot of what I want to say about teaching Dominion is specific to Dominion, but a lot of what I want to say is general advice about teaching board games that I've had success with, assuming that you know the game well enough and, you know, you've taught it maybe a couple times, just to give you some ideas. And then, you know, those ideas will apply to Dominion and it'll be good exercise. Yeah, and uh, before we jump into that, I have a, a general, a couple of general principles on board game teaching. I have taught a lot of board games as well, and I have taught some very well, I have taught some very poorly, um, and I can tell you... <laughs> Um, there, there's some general principles that I would give you just as anybody teaching board games to anyone. This also includes Dominion. Um, I do feel like people, board gamers, and this also applies to the concept of like a gateway game. Um, people tend to, board gamers tend to assume that non-board gamers are stupid and, or rather they forget that like, these people we're teaching to are usually other adults mm. who are like functioning members of society. So <laughs> I will say that like both when you're selecting games to show people who are like not super into the hobby yet and when you're teaching games, remember that the people you're talking to are not stupid. Um, don't like <laughs> try to demean their intelligence by like a trying to like oversimplify something when you're teaching it to them or or thinking that certain games are like, just in I mean, like, seriously, it's not that much harder for somebody who has never played a board game before to grasp a complex board game than it is for you to do it. Having, like, experience with board games doesn't, like, help you learn complicated board games better. So, and, like, just, just talk to them, talk to, um non-board gamers the way you would talk to board gamers is my <laughs> advice they're not stupid <laughs> yeah i uh so i when i teach dominion i do like kind of the demo game yeah uh which i'll talk about uh, more in, in detail in a little bit but uh, w what i want to say is that after the demo game even non-gamers even people who've hardly played any board games before after that demo game i can just throw them in the deep end yeah like i can bring out expansions and all these new mechanics and like they're fine Dominion is not a very complex game. Not really. And I, I mean, mean, there's a lot going on, but you don't see all of it every game. Most I'm not of, teaching them 400 Kingdom cards. I'm just most, them dead. most of the stuff that they need to understand mechanically is right in front of them every game that they're playing. It's right in front of them on the card. They can read it. Yeah, you want to give them the tools to you know figure out how certain cards work rather than telling them all of the mechanics. So um, let me... Let me let me start getting into this. So, yeah. uh, a general principle I have for teaching board games: uh, it's very important to get actually playing the game as quickly as possible. Um, it, it's, People have short attention spans. Uh, well, well, yeah, but like playing is is really the best way to internalize the mechanics of the game. I can explain. I can take fifteen minutes and explain all the rules of this complex game to you, and then we start playing, and I'm like, what? <laughs> yeah. 
Like, which which of those things do I need to know now, and how do I piece it into the big picture? And, like, I mean, in, in Dominion, you can get through an entire game in 10 minutes. So, like, you, you, in 10 minutes, I could talk to you, or in 10 minutes, I could show you how the game goes end-to-end. -end. And, and even if that game doesn't mean much, if it was 10 minutes, we can just start the game over and now play a real game super fast. In a long game, it's important, you know, because you want to not spend 20 minutes explaining rules but in dominion like it's short enough you can actually get away with this yeah this overlaps a lot with uh some of the advice that shut up and sit down gave when they uh did, which i recommend this video that they made as well uh they have a video on their website just about the art of teaching board games and one of Never the key it. it's a good one uh one of the key pieces of advice they give you is um get components into people's hands as quickly as you can in a way that like won't confuse them you know um, and get get them like moving around and interacting with these components as quickly as you can. Just get them tactilely interacting with the board game as quickly as you can. It's really good to hear that because yeah. like I'm saying things based off my experience, and yeah. other people have had similar experience and yeah. had success with it, and now I feel really good about myself. Yeah, that's what we're here for. So uh, the the reason I say this, and I mean that's true for every game in Dominion. Uh, I want to explain rules as quickly as possible and start actually having turns. And so um, when I'm explaining rules, I um, I don't explain the action phase. Like, yeah, I, right. I'm, I'm we are playing the game before they know what an action phase is. Yeah. Uh, so uh, when when someone has an action card in hand, uh, then I will explain it. Uh, and, you know, normally people, I mean, I'll buy an action card on my turn just, you know, to do an example hand or, or something like that. It, it, it'll get explained. But um, that's that's not, it's not important that they know what's going on before they're doing things. So um, the, the, way I, the, the way I do Dominion is I set up a five-card kingdom for kind of a demo game. And uh, once we do the demo game, I'll add five more to play, like, a real Kingdom of Dominion. Why do I do five? You don't have to do five. Like, if someone is used to board games and they're like, don't baby me, like, sure, get out ten, whatever. But uh, you really only need five games to explain most of the mechanics of Dominion and get them playing. Um, and so there are mechanics that I specifically like to include for that first game. Yeah. Uh, and, and it goes like this. Uh, all the vanilla bonuses, so plus cards, plus buy, plus money... Plus actions, and, and I think of plus one action and plus two actions as separate vanilla bonuses. Yeah, those are they do different things if you think about it functionally. Uh, like the yeah. plus one action just replaces itself, whereas the plus two actions creates a different game state. Uh, yeah, it, mechanically it changes what it does to their turn, and, yeah. and they they should be they should have the ability to be exposed to that experience in the yep. first game. Uh, also, I include something that makes it matter that you draw at the end of your turn and not at the start of your turn. So the classic example of this is like militia, but it could also be like a council room or whatever. Sure. Just uh, make it make it important that uh, some people, you know, they want to pay attention to their opponents, so they, I, I'll, I'll wait to draw my turn, it's fine. No, it's important that you have the cards in your hand, and so just something that makes that matter. Um, something that will um, make them discard a card from their hand. Uh, and the reason for this is because then it's it's very natural to um, to explain to them, oh, no, you can only discard when the card directs you to discard. It's just a very common thing to think, oh, well, I can put these estates in my discard whenever I want. And then library comes up, and it's like, oh, well, library's OP because I can just discard the cards I don't want. Well, no, that's not how that works. So um, I usually like Oasis, but Baron yeah. is fine with that. Both of these are not or cards in the base set. Seller. Uh, yeah, so like, Seller, if you only own base set, Seller's definitely yeah. the one to go to. But Oasis is a much simpler card than Seller. Yeah, this and, is And true. it actually, like, teaches them strategy things, like, right away. Mm -hmm. About, like, hand size and opportunity costs, and, like, I, I really like Oasis. For you can part. talk about, like, you took this Oasis and, like, compare it to the Silver. Talk about what it did do, what like, it didn't do. Like, how are you going to make more than $5 with this? Well, yeah. you need silver. Like, it's, it's a really great lesson. Yeah. So I, I really am a big fan of Oasis. Uh, and then also a card with text on it, because yeah. you want to show them that cards have text on it, right? Yeah. I, I mean, a lot of this stuff will, will happen, but make sure you have cards with text on it. You don't want people thinking that Dominion is a game with, like, boring vanilla bonuses. 
and that that comes back to the thing that I said earlier about like it's not just about insulting their intelligence, um, and this applies to Dominion as well as all board games. If you're like trying to like show somebody board gaming, um, there there is also a very real risk when you are teaching a board game or board games to somebody that if you are too simple and you don't show them enough of sort of the exotic um, design space that you've been exploring, uh, that they'll think that what the, you've just been that the they'll think like they're looking at this this simplistic smooth, yeah like it's stupid like there's a shallow uh, th- yeah thing that there's nothing to you want to whet their appetite yeah and like normally when I'm teaching Dominion my gigantic Dominion box is right there on the table and right. I'm saying by the way we're only playing with five of these but here's four hundred right here and these are the cards that we're using so far and it's this tiny fraction of the box yeah and that usually does uh that has this impact yeah Yeah. so like my my demo kingdom if i could choose any cards i choose village smithy market militia and oasis yeah and we play a game with those five cards and and you can substitute like i mentioned before yeah um the only yeah so the only things i would add to that um are that, and this is just something I like to do, to, I notice that people tend to not always understand if they've never played a deck builder before what trashing is versus discarding. So, like, sometimes I will, like, literally, if I'm trashing a card, like, chuck it to the other side of the table <laughs> versus, like, getting militia discarded, I put it in my discard pile. And, like, yes, it's, like, funny the first time it happens because the... You know, they weren't expecting me to throw things, and I'm throwing things. But um, also, like, it gets across, there's no doubt about it, this is a different (laughs) thing that happened. This card has gone out of my life. I threw it across the room. Um, Uh, when When I trash a card, like, it goes in the box, and, like, I try and you know throw it at the lid with some force yeah it makes a really satisfying noise right and like yes it's silly but it also actually does serve a purpose to like have you have you ever like chappled a hand and just chuck the card straight up and let them fall (laughs) you need to try it it feels so good and the other other thing that feels so good is you donate and you have this stack of cards and i chuck it at the (laughs) box and it hits the lid that's standing straight up and the sound it makes and if there's someone you don't like, you can just <laughs> chuck them right at their face. It is such a satisfying um, sound. Yeah. Like, here's here's some cards with sleeves, and, like, if you aim it with the right direction, it will kind of snap against the lid with some heft. And, like, yeah. oh, my God. You need to try these things before you die if you've never tried them. Anyway, yeah. uh, but also for that reason, uh, um, sometimes I, you know, there are mechanics I don't include in that demo game. And, you know, the first one is trashing. Yeah. Uh, the second one is gaining, other than multiple buys. Like midterm uh, gaining, yeah. Yeah. Uh, junking, uh, kingdom cards that aren't action cards, uh, reactions. I, I don't even explain the three-pile ending rule until after the first game is over. Just because I yeah. want to get them playing, get the mechanics of the game ingrained in them, and let them see the progression of the game from start to finish. Like, oh, my deck sucks. Now my deck is better. Now I'm buying provinces with my deck. Oh, the provinces are gone. The game is over. And now they know what it feels like. So yeah, now when they you have the a... DNA of Dominion, they, yeah, they get it. The A B C D of Dominion, the yeah. A B C DNA of Dominion. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, and and it's, you know, it can be difficult because like sometimes okay, if they're more experienced, if they played a deck builder, merge the first two games, it's fine. But like, one of my one of my biggest pet peeves when I'm explaining a game to people is that like I'm not explaining some rules deliberately in the beginning because it's not time. <laughs> Like, yeah. give them the big picture first, and then, you know, let them fill in the details with the mechanics. But when you're telling them the mechanical things, many people learn more effectively by knowing where it fits in the big picture because they know what the big picture is. And so I'll be explaining something, and we won't be done with the first game yet, and they're going to talk about all these rules that aren't relevant or that I haven't explained yet. And it's just... It's infuriating to me because, like, I said I was going to explain the game. You don't need to interrupt me, first of all. But also, like, I have this momentum. I'm engaging them. I have their attention because what I'm doing is making sense to them, and I've practiced this before. Yeah, if I'm I'm ever teaching a game of Dominion and the words lose track come up, 
Um, God. Something has gone horribly wrong. But, uh, <laughs> yeah. That's uh, not... Yeah, so, uh, the one thing I would uh, say here is, on a little bit of a different note, um, there is... A, a different people have different opinions on this. This is my opinion, and I will say. that we're t Let's talk about how quote-unquote hard you go on people i guess oh yeah sure. when you teach um so there's i mean obviously you know the game um you may be very good at the game and when you're teaching somebody they're probably not going to be as good and um there's always this question of like do i just crush them and just show them like how how the game is played properly or do i uh do i go easy on them do i do i do some weird stuff and just like We'll give them a chance. Um, okay, so... I, I'm not an advocate of going easy on someone. You throwing and tryharding. Those are the yeah. extremes. Do I try hard or do I throw? With that said, like, the first game, sometimes I'll just play Smithy Big Money. I will... I advocate for something in between. It's, yeah, it's kind of weird. Definitely read the room. Yeah, I mean, like, so first off, when I'm teaching Dominion, I don't usually have this, like, you know, uh, this perfect example kingdom like adam's talking about sometimes i do but like usually it's just with a random kingdom um so how am i teaching this game and how hard am i going what i'm when it when i'm playing a normal game of dominion what i am doing is um evaluating all the options to me coming up with this list of what what are the reasonable options and then i'm uh comparing and contrasting where all of those reasonable options leave me um and when i'm playing an example game where i'm teaching um, I do that same process, except I stop early. I take the options that are available to me, I take this list of reasonable options, and then I just go with the first one. I don't think about it, I just do the first reasonable thing that pops into my head. The result of that is that um, they see me kind of, they see vaguely what a Dominion strategy looks like, uh, a reasonable one, and they can be uh, and I'm not really thinking about my turns. I'm not tracking my deck. I'm not like I'm just uh, doing the first reasonable thing that pops into my head. So they see, you know, vaguely what a game of Dominion will look like when somebody is strategizing. But they see me doing it kind of sloppily, and they have a chance to win. But I am paying very close attention and analyzing their turns and their uh, their strategy. And if they ask me for advice, I'm ready to give them the whole breakdown and show them the whole process so that they can see. You know as much of how the strategic depth of the game works as they want to and you can give them uh, one of my dominion business cards and tell yeah. them to check out the video tutorial series which yeah. by the way uh just updated uh link For in the 2019. description uh well it's actually the second update in 2019 but uh yeah yeah it's uh got got two new videos in the series anyway the, the one thing i would advise you not do is do random nonsensical stuff to like throw and get, just don't do that it's super whenever you are like going easy on people in any game it's usually like super transparent like they know what you're doing it's not a real game that they're playing so they don't even mm. really come away knowing like what a game of it is like because yeah. they don't like know it have a real opponent it's like it's just just don't do it yeah either or i, you I don't can think just... ever even when you're not teaching like that's just yeah don't, don't don't do that or you can try hard and crush them and that's a different approach that works for some gamers that's a read yeah. the room kind of thing yeah. like there are certain people who like i just know as gamers and if i teach them dominion i'm gonna try hard and i'm gonna destroy them because that will motivate them mm. to then learn and then try to do the same thing back to me oh yeah and yeah. then they won't but they'll, they'll work <laughs> um one day yeah but they'll get there yeah so, um, I have a couple of other general principles for board games that uh, sort of want to go over yeah. here. Just things I've learned. Uh, the first one is I like to explain things top-down. Uh, what that means is I start with uh, stating the overall objective of the game, and then broader terms, what you're trying to do, how you get it to happen, uh, and then gradually lower level until you get into mechanics. So, um, in Dominion, I'll say, for example, the goal is to get the most victory points, and you get victory points by adding green cards to your deck. And look at this, the province, uh, provinces are worth the most, and uh, usually the person who gets the most of them wins the game. Also, the game is over when they're, they're gone. 
Uh, now they're the most expensive card in the game, so most of the time you're going to spend your first several turns building your deck so that you can actually buy them. And then uh, the twist is that once you add it to your deck, it does nothing. It makes your deck worse. So after that, after that, like, what, 15-second description, if I edit out the vocal filler, it would be even less, then I start explaining what happens on their turn. And now when I'm explaining what happens on their turn, they know where it fits in the big picture. Now, I understand that, uh, you know, this works for a lot of people, and it helps them contextualize what I'm saying so that they remember it better. Um, this is not the case for everyone. Not everyone learns the same way. Uh, but the, the nice thing about it is if someone doesn't learn that way and they want to hear the mechanics first, they can just zone out for 15 seconds, or they can just say, okay, I don't yeah. care, give me some mechanics, and then it's fine. If you do it the other way around and you just start explaining mechanics, you've lost a lot of people, and it's hard to get them back. Yeah. That's a reasonable, that's reasonable, yeah. So, like, in, in other games, just, you know, 10 or 15 seconds to give you the big picture, and then just enough so that they know where the mechanics fit in to what they care about. That I found yeah. that really helps a lot. I mean, I, I generally have a roadmap for, for teaching a game, and it, uh, any game, and it has the same way, where I just first give a general thematic overview not thematic but general over top down overview then yeah. uh get and into the objective and then how the mechanics fit into that overview to achieve the objective sure and for every game you know there are a lot of different ways you can do that and a lot of them are going to be worse than others and so it, you know just try it out a lot i guess yeah in dominion i can say that and then start talking about turns but uh, in other games, it can be a little more complex, and practice really helps. Just, you know, try and read how they're receiving what you're saying. If you're getting questions about things that you've explicitly explained, that's not great. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, another tip is uh, you really want them to trust you. Um, what you really want is during this demo game for them to be playing on their own and making their own decisions, and then, you know, living with the consequences of those decisions. Uh, and because that's a really good way for them to understand the mechanics. I yeah. open with a village. I see what the village does, but wait a second. I didn't have any actions to play with that village. Well, okay. Maybe I shouldn't have opened with the village. But now I know what the village is for. Yeah. So, um, you know, you, what you don't want to happen is they open a village and they are totally screwed because they open a village, <laughs> right? So, you know, maybe if I see them open with a village, I, I won't play super hard. Uh, you know, to give them a chance, or maybe I will. But uh, the you need them to trust you. Um, especially, this is especially true for longer games, where you can't afford to just start over and, and just play the whole game again. You don't want them to get an hour and a half into the game and then be totally screwed because of the thing they did on turn one. So the trust that they need to have in you is you need to tell them, I'm going to let you make the decisions you want, but if I see you making something that I think is a clear mistake something that I think will hurt you in the long run. I will stop you. I will tell you why. Or, you know, if you don't understand the mechanics of why, I will just say, trust me. And then I will tell you some other reasonable options you can take. Yeah, like, I will let them open with a village. I'm not going to let them open with a duchy. Yeah. Like, I, I will stop them if they get a state cop or a curse, pretty much at any point when it's not appropriate. Or if they green just way too early. Yeah. Like, I'll stop that. But really, uh, that's about it. Yeah. I mean, they're going to be able to have a functional deck. And, you know, they could still win. Yeah, you got to remember that part of just games in general, what makes them fun is making decisions and exploring choices. Mm. So, like, if you, you want to make sure that you're giving that to them. So, like, don't, like, don't heavy hand them and do a strategy that you think is good just because you think they'll want to see a deck come together like them let them make decisions and draw cards that they bought and then see hey i bought this card and now it doesn't do anything crap yeah and, um but yeah I mean, and a lot of people will uh, kind of just mirror what you do anyway yeah so if you want them to you know have a good strategy that's very effective sometimes all you have to do is just do it yourself and yeah. that's okay There's yeah nothing wrong with that uh the the final tip i have is you want to correct mechanics the first time they show up yeah uh, you really so if you f see people like moving cards in a way they shouldn't like uh, they don't put their treasures on the table to play them or you know they put their cards in their discard pile 
to play them, that kind of thing. Um, you need to correct them the first time and every time it shows up. And it, it, it can feel like you're being a little bit annoying because you're constantly harping on them, but this kind of thing needs to be muscle memory. Because when it is muscle memory, especially in Dominion's <laughs> case, but, I mean, this will apply to other games, when it is muscle memory in Dominion, they understand the base mechanics so well. You've, um, you've given them the tools they need to identify other kingdom cards that may come up. Yeah. And, first of all, properly execute those without you needing to explain what's really going on. Right. right. If someone picks a, if someone knows the mechanics of the game and they pick up library, I mean, it's a big wall of text. But if you've done a good job, they can pick up that card and they can read it and they can understand not only what it does, but like why that's a good card and a good effect that you want. Because, uh, well, if I play a library, why would I want to set aside my actions? Oh, maybe I don't have any actions left. Maybe I want to draw my treasures. You know, like that. that's something that is just automatic if if the <laughs> mechanics of the game are muscle memory and they're understood this happens a lot faster if you never let them do it wrong and you really only have to correct the same thing like two or three times most people um that's good enough and they're not annoyed by it because now you can just start chucking cards at them from the box I mean, look at this this one's fun this one's fun this one's fun and they and they their eyes get wide because they're thinking about the big world of possibilities as opposed yeah. to Oh my god, look at all of this text. Look at all of these things. I have to know what all of them do. That's so much memorization. Like, you right. give them an orange card, and they don't even know what duration is, but they can read it, and they can intuit what it is. I've had so many people come back at me. I hand them Caravan. They're like, oh, so it does something, that, and, and oh, you keep it out? You, yeah, you don't clean it. Oh, okay, great. And they want to play with all the duration cards. I didn't even explain that to them. They just kind of guess what it is. Dominion is a game that's really well done in that sense. Yeah. You can just read the card and now you know everything you need to know in yeah. almost every case. And, you know, to the game designer's credit, I, I happen to know Donald takes a lot of, like, yeah. takes very, uh, a lot of purpose and intention to making the cards that way. And, like, if a card is not shaping up to be that way, he's not afraid to cut it. Or just drastically change the soul of the card so that it's easier to understand. Yeah. Because that's much more important than, like, balance of power. Because, you know, everyone has access to the supply. Dominion kind of balances itself in that way. Yeah. It's like Laissez faire. <laughs> yeah, for better or worse. Yeah. Yeah, so uh, those are those are just kind of generic teaching board game things but you know as they apply applied to dominion explaining things top down gain their trust and then uh correcting mechanics the first time they show up yeah i think that's really um I, i've had a lot of success with it yep and uh, i mean like i just want to stress one more thing that from earlier uh just as the big takeaway um and you know not to overshoot any of adam's points but i just want to remind you again that these board games you're playing with are adults and they're not stupid and even if they are stupid they're not as stupid as you think they are <laughs> please don't insult their intelligence by oversimplifying things and, and trying to or trying to gloss over things that you shouldn't just mm. shove the, show them the part of the hobby that got you to like it yeah, yeah. anyway so yeah. So now uh, we have a kingdom, and we're gonna play my demo kingdom. For, yeah. Uh, no, 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 no. The Oasis. My, yeah. Seller. <laughs> no. uh, yeah. Okay. So it's got a remake. This one's got yeah. Spoiler it's mostly alert. about remake, and uh, we're gonna be teaching it to random people in the mall. Yeah. Now, um, I'm gonna <laughs> video it, and uh, that's gonna be no. Anyway, um, so we have Chariot Race, uh -huh. Ghost Town, Golem, Port, Remake, Haunted Woods, Jester, Mystic. Wine Merchant, Horde, and Expedition. One more time for our audio-only listeners. Chariot Race, Ghost Town, Golem, Port, Remake, Haunted Woods, Jester, Mystic, Wine Merchant, Horde, and Expedition. Okay. So Jake, is Remake good here? No. No, yeah, it's super good here, yeah. It's the you're, only trashing. Yeah, you're opening with a remake, for sure. Oh, um, uh, yeah. 
Yeah, I yeah. think even on a 5-2, I would probably just get the remake. I'd be sad, but uh, I would have been remake nothing on 5 Um, I'm pretty okay with taking, like, remake Expedition, too, on a 4-3. Um, on... What do you get with that remake? Hmm. And if I... If I, um... Don't draw my remake on my expedition hand. I might just take another expedition on it. Depends on what I hit. Okay, so depend depends on the price points I'm hitting with. That I hand. think on a four three, you're going to be better served by remake Ghost Town, and here's why: because if you um, if you get remake expedition, you're going to draw seven cards. You're going to have eleven in your deck. Four and eleven shot that your remake's going to miss the shuffle. Yes, you can get an expedition there, but like you might be giving up a fiver for it. Um, if you get the Ghost Town, however, your Ghost Town's going to stay out. You're going to draw six cards on turn three, five cards on turn four if you don't get another Ghost Town, which don't do that if you didn't see your remake. Now your remake is guaranteed to be in turns three or four. Yeah, and it's okay. Not gonna miss. It's not going to miss the shuffle, but you're also drawing it with one fewer card in hand. I'm thinking about the situation where I get to trash what? two states. One fewer card in hand? Yeah, if I if I expedition, I'm drawing two extra cards. If you draw through. the remake, yeah, you're yeah. Gonna, the the whole point of this up with less estates. The po- the whole point of this for me is to draw my remake in a hand with two estates. That's the whole reason I'm trying. Man, to I'm this. not in a hurry to do that. I I'm not, on a four three. Like I'm opening Ghost Town all day. I like this much more. Um, but the thing is, I don't really want the Ghost Town in the deck. I definitely want Ghost Towns in this deck. Uh, I mean, it's, I mean, Haunted Woods uh, hard counters okay. it, but like. I'll just remake the stupid things into ports when that happens. Like, oh, oh, Ghost keep... Town is so good early on. How is I it good early it. on? I'm not going to have that many terminals. It, it not yet. gives me Unless a 0% chance remake. of of missing, uh, the remake missing the shuffle. Sure, I don't know. I mean, yes, the remake missing the shuffle is terrible. I'm playing around, I'm assuming that that 4 and 11 isn't happening. I'm that's, playing that's around actually, that not happening. That's, that's actually more likely than if you just open remake silver. You're what's, increasing what's the chance of your remake missing the shuffle. I know, but I'm playing around it not happening. Um, uh, it's a four and eleven. It's, it's a one too in th- much. It's basically much. a one in three, and the upside of it not happening is really good. So, I uh, yeah. Anyway, I guess we we just have different. You know, we, we're we're it's talking a play about style different thing for sure. Different levels of risk nuts. that we're taking on. I I think this risk is just. Way beyond what I think is worth taking. It's a one in three. Uh, yeah. You're drawing two extra cards, so missing the shuffle. At least you're two cards into that shuffle. Uh, anyway, you're so one card into that shuffle. Whatever. Anyway, uh, so then, uh, yeah, I think yeah. When you taking... thin down, uh, you get some haunted woods for draw. Uh, you need wine merchants for buys. Get lots of ports. Yeah. Mm, yeah. I think that chariot race is probably a pretty important card here. I don't think chariot race is super important. Um, I think you probably maybe gain some from the remake. Maybe I don't know. Here, here's why maybe. I think here's why I think it is important. Um, the deck here is not the deck that we're building, where we have like haunted woods and wine merchants and everything. Um, it's either slow or it's not reliable. Like you can build up a bunch with the haunted woods and make it reliable. Uh, but that, that's slow to do, or you can... Well, yeah, I mean, I, mean, I think that's the way to go. I'm right? just... Haunted Woods makes you build more. Yeah. I, I mean, I don't think you green super early here. I'm just thinking that the chariot races can, like, really score a lot of points if you if you don't... If They're you're gonna not score some points, for sure. They're gonna score some points. Uh, and... Your gains are limited, though. Well, you're gonna... I you, mean... You have three of them off your remake, Trashing Estates... And then you've got Wine Merchant for buys. I, oh, I feel like, like you're going to be using every buy, like every turn. Well, that's that's actually an interesting question. Are you gaining Chariot Races off your estates? I think I am. Um, over I think Silver. It, chariot it, Race instead of Silver. I think it depends a lot. I think <sighs> It does. I think it's rare I'm going to be getting Silvers, because either Ghost Town or Chariot Race is going to be better in most situations. Yeah, yeah. Um, or, you know, for buys, Expedition, right? <laughs> Um, but we're talking about turning estates into things. Sure, yeah. So, yeah. I think, um, I think Horde is really great. It, it makes me not want silver because I can just grab a Horde and start greening. Right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, this is true. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I think the Chariot Race, I mean, I, I guess 
when we talk about how important they are, we're both talking about getting them. So I guess like it really doesn't matter what we're saying about how important they are. Um, are you getting a second remake? Okay, so this is um, this I'm, is this is our original disagreement that that prompted us to do this kingdom. Yeah, here. I'm getting one. I'm getting a second remake. I think if I know my remake is missing the shuffle, then uh, then I open three four right. I I open three four. I can't do the ghost town trick, and. Uh, what am I getting there, actually? I, I think it is a silver. It is a silver. Yeah, I'll do silver remake. And let's say I know my remake is going to miss that shuffle. So yeah, I, this, I turn four. Haven't seen my remake. I know it's in those bottom two. I've got four. I'm getting a second remake there for sure. Actually, okay. wait a second. In that case, I'm getting Expedition turn three. Okay, this is really unlikely. I, I don't see myself getting a second remake in most cases just because I, I would rather have that port. I think the port's going to do just about everything that second remake's going to do, although, uh, I mean, th there is a chance I don't draw, but, like, man, I just want to play my one remake more often. I don't think I'm going to get a second remake hardly ever. Um, I, will, I want the second remake most of the time. Um, I want to thin faster, and I want to uh, get a five cost. I don't think you need more reason than that. I think it's a good and There's way to... so many tools to play the one remake more often. I think that's going to be better for getting fivers. I, I think it'll thin you... Not I mean, as fast. those tools are there, but so is getting a second remake, and the second remake turns into a five cost later. So and does having two of them is a more reliable way to play it more often. Port so, is better at turning into a five cost, so the upside here is you get to think faster. Yeah, and that's, I'm saying that's the main reason I'm doing it. And I'm saying I would rather spend, uh, you know, some of my three dollar gains on, you know, getting a ghost town to help with that. And uh, I would rather maybe get an expedition or two in the right sitch to help me play my one remake more often. I don't think it's likely you're going to be playing them one more than one remake a turn. Sure. I'd rather just focus on my remake never missing a shuffle. That's that's the way I want to build this deck. Okay, so we talked about um, that little disagreement there. Uh, for the most part, we're talking about building a similar deck, though. You like Horde? Yeah, yeah, I do. Okay. I do. I, I also kind of like it for... I like it for scaling up payload pretty quickly. Yeah. Um, Agreed. you're obviously using Wine Merchant for buys, but, you know, terminals are a thing, even with port. Um, and it's also... Un I don't think I'm gonna get more than one Wine Merchant. I could see it, but... The Horde's pretty good for if you have Chariot Races, because Gold and Province are expensive cards. And, Hot diggity. Um, you know, so, yeah. Um, now, and, you know, obviously Haunted Woods drawing a bunch. Uh, what do you think about... Well, Chariot Race and Mystic have some interaction, and it's not like, I don't know if that makes it worth putting a Mystic in the deck. I don't really like Mystic. I don't um, like Jester, and I certainly don't like Golem. Well, okay, yeah, Golem, screw Golem. It's a bad card. Yeah. Screw Golem, um, and probably screw Mystic, even though it has that interaction with Chariot Race. I would need to think about that. That doesn't seem worth going for or anything. Jester, I want to, Jester is intriguing, um... Uh, maybe uh, Jester's seems... okay. I, I shouldn't dismiss Jester. So I, I don't dismiss it. I don't know if it's worth my terminal space, but um, if my opponent it has thinned, is. if my opponent has thinned pretty quickly, um, yeah, I'm probably prioritizing the Jester because those extra games are nice. Because and even if they haven't, Jester's probably good. Uh, junking them is nice. Yeah. And you get Jester's your first fiver. That's not crazy. It's not, because early on, the Haunted Woods is doing less, uh, because you're not going to be drawing it consistently, so... Yeah, huh. I kind of want Jester as the first flavor. Um, I can see situations where I get something else, like a Haunted Woods or maybe a Whiny, but... Yeah. I can see Jester. Yeah, okay. Yeah, I shouldn't have dismissed it. Yeah, it's probably good. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah. I don't what, know. Do, what do you, the the listener, think? Do you, uh, how often do you think you're getting a second remake? Yeah. Uh, do you think that you're ever getting ghost towns, even in the hard counter uh, haunted woods, the haunted woods, you know, hard counters, the night cards, so yeah. you can't play them. So I mean, obviously, I don't want too many of them, and they'll probably be remade if you know once my opponent has haunted woods out every turn. Into ports. Uh, yeah, probably ports. <laughs> uh, my only other option is potion and remake. Second remake. <laughs> right. Yeah, so maybe... Uh, yeah, it's not happening. So, great. Uh, <laughs> what's your first fiver? 
Uh, how would you open on a 4-3? Are you going to get that expedition? Yeah. On a 3-4, don't get the expedition, by the way. Uh, yeah, yeah, turn one expedition. Not so great. Yeah, unless, like, there's some fiber. Yeah, whatever. Still not great. Not here. Not here. Yeah. Yeah, good talk. Yeah, and uh, also, just a little bit of a reminder, uh, two episodes from now, Q&A episode, so, uh, you know, a day or two after this is released... Uh, maybe we haven't recorded everything yet. Get your questions in if you want to hear them. We have a few, uh, few left over from the last time. Uh, we've heard some a couple from a couple people for this time. Uh, we'll be answering those questions uh, on that mini sode. And uh, yeah, thanks for listening. Yep. To episode eighty-three. Making luck. So was Dominion ever fun for you? Um, I don't think so. Is, I don't remember is anything back. ever fun for you? Oh god, I probably not. Um, yeah. Do you know what fun is? If you've never had anything be fun, well, maybe, what... maybe it is fun then. Maybe everything's fun, and I just. Yeah, haven't properly identified it. Why? Why do you play Dominion? Um, probably because I can't stop. <laughs> why did you start? I don't know. I mean, you could ask smokers that too, and they probably don't have a good answer. Mm. Probably because they saw their friends doing it and it looked cool. That's fair. Yeah. And then you won that tournament. And you're like, oh, I can make money off this. Yeah. <laughs> I was like, yeah. oh man, and it was all downhill from there. Yeah. Now um, you're on this podcast. Yeah. 83 I know. episodes in. I know. What? <laughs> Not even once. Where, where um, did this year and a half go? Like I have no idea.